Paul will begin, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you, Joanne. Hello. So our goal over the next few minutes is to introduce you to the enormous progress that we and others have made over the last decade and a half in understanding the fundamental biology of the human condition. We'll begin with a brief introduction to the scientific problem and its solution, and that will then lead us immediately to diverse practical implications for the human future. First, the problem. So we build enormous cities and expend energy extravagantly. We take command of the surface of the Earth such that other creatures, by and large, survive at our discretion. Indeed, we even aspire to walk among the stars. So by any objective measure, we are a completely unique kind of animal. Moreover, we got that way in an amazing hurry. This is a uh, diagram of our recent evolutionary history. The red nodes here represent ancestral species that gave rise to currently surviving lineages. Notice that chimps are more closely related to us than they are to gorillas, and yet they resemble gorillas much more than they resemble us. The implication of this is that our unique status emerged explosively recently. The question is why? Notice that everything that we can do, and indeed our unique properties like speech and cognitive virtuosity, are all either direct effects or evolutionary adaptations to a single thing, an expanded scale of social cooperation. We now recognize that our one-of-a-kind status emerged as a result of a social revolution in our lineage beginning around two million years ago, and social coercion theory allows us to understand and explain that transparently and simply. Specifically, all individual animals have interests, and those are often in conflicts with the interests of other individuals. Thus, the capacity, the scale of social cooperation that an animal can achieve is entirely limited by its ability to manage this conflict of interest problem. However, the capacity to manage conflicts of interest depends on the ability to project coercive threat. And unfortunately for non-human animals, they can only do this in a prohibitively expensive way as a result of hand-to-hand -hand direct interaction, combat. Our unique social revolution emerged when our first pre, last pre-human ancestors evolved the capacity to project threat inexpensively by projecting threat from a distance as a result of the evolution of the capacity for elite aim throwing. Indeed, we still to this day occasionally take to the streets and use that capability in prosecution of our individual uh, interests. As this cartoon illustrates in pink at the upper right, in an animal that can project threat from a distance, a group of cooperative individuals can inexpensively project overwhelming coercive threat against a social parasite. This makes what we think of as law enforcement inexpensive, allowing the immediate emergence of uh, expanded social cooperation. This is the fundamental human trick. We use the capacity for mutual coercion to insist on cooperative, humane, even noble behavior from one another, something non-human animals cannot do. This unique human social strategy pervades every aspect of our lives through the present moment and into the future. One last item of background. Over our two million year history, we've invented many other weapons after our evolution of elite throwing. But most of those weapons lend themselves to broad distribution of access to coercive threat, producing democratized societies. However, over the last several millennia, it's become technically possible to develop weapons that lend themselves to the monopoly capture of coercive threat by small elites producing extremely hierarchical societies. This conflict between hierarchy and democracy is the central substance of all of our written history and is crucial to understanding our options for the future, we will argue. Joanne is now going to begin that argument by exploring the evolution of our unique sexuality in the an ancient democratized human social environment and then turning attention to the exaggeration of our capacity for evil in hierarchical environments. Joanne. Human sexual behavior evolving in the ancestral democratic social environment. The ability to manage conflicts of interest created some very different characteristics for us social units, democracy being one, but there were others. For instance, now our social units could be larger. We had many individuals that were not related of both sexes that now could be within the same social unit. I'm sure many of you are aware right now of the current debate going on in science, whether we're designed to be monogamous or whether we're designed to be promiscuous. I'd like to make a point, though. 
In order for either of those strategies to be viable, we need to be able to manage conflicts of interest first. Why would that be? What about monogamy? What do we need to suppress? We need to suppress cheating. We need to suppress uh, prostitution. We need to suppress rape. And we need to suppress promiscuity because it's not the agreed upon system by the majority. However, what about promiscuity? What do we need to suppress? We need to suppress that extreme sexual, sexual jealousy that each one of us would feel in that environment. We also need to police monogamy if that's not the accepted system within that, within that society. So we need to manage conflicts of interest between, before either one of those is a viable strategy. So this gave us another unique capability. We could oscillate between two viable strategies depending on context. And there were times in our ancestral environment where we did switch between these two contexts. Now, of course, we have to ask, well, what was that context? The context is adult mortality risk. There were times that our ancestors were faced with wealth and health, and there was a chance that both of them would live to see their children to reproductive age. Therefore, adult mortality risk was low. In this case, monogamy was a great choice. Men who knew, knew who their children were, and women could depend on the assistance of the, the full assistance of the male in helping to raise those children. However, there are also times in, the, in our ancestral history where our ancestors faced terrible famine, disease, even war. And adult mortality risk was very high. Chances were that one or both of you could die before your children reached reproductive age. Now today, what would we do? Well, we'd buy life insurance. We'd go to Prudential or Allstate in order to do that. But they didn't have Prudential or Allstate or any corporation to buy life insurance from in the ancestral environment. So what did they do? They invested in promiscuous behavior by investing in each other. So that if someone actually died, what would happen is they believed in partible paternity, or they believed that children could have more than one father. So that if, some, if either you or your spouse died, there were others in the village who might be the father that would contribute to the resources of that child. Life insurance in the ancestral environment. Now, you have to ask, both viable solutions were back and forth. So what did they adapt to? Flexibility. They weren't naturally monogamous or naturally promiscuous. They could be uniquely flexible. There's a very famous biologist by the name of Ernst Marr who made the statement that natural selection anticipates the past. Now, what this means is that each of us has inherited the psychological mechanisms that were, pri that were priorly uh, adaptive in the past. So social coercion theory kind of explains why, in the current environment, we have these intense feelings of being in love that every one of us experiences. However, it also explains that wandering eye that we all have once in a while, or the thoughts of others. While sex is a very interesting subject, I'd like to get onto something that's actually more important, which is democracy, hierarchy, and human welfare. At this point in our evolutionary history, we can consider ourselves the pedagogical, the economic, and the ethical animal at an incredibly large scale. But we have a problem, and so did our ancestors. Whose interests do these systems serve? Well, social coercion theory also can make a prediction. If credible threat or the ability to control law enforcement is in the hands of the many, well, then that society will, hands, will, uh, will be for the benefit of the many or the majority. However, if that threat gets into the hands of a few, what do we expect? That entire society will be made to serve them. Why is this? In a hierarchical system, Selfish behavior of the few cannot be contained. It cannot be forestalled by the majority. There's nothing they can do about it. And the, the minority will even believe that they'll justify their own behavior in saying that, well, we work harder, or we're smarter, or we've been ordained by God. The majority can do nothing to stop them. However, in a democracy, when everyone has access to coercive threat, what happens? We all watch each other back and forth. We all make sure we're behaving ethically. So we end up with self-interested cooperation. Now, 
There are certain characteristics that we can look at when we talk about uh, hierarchical systems. They should be self-serving to only a few. They should be inhumane and brutal to most. In fact, they'll force others to become inhumane and brutal to each other. They'll also have wide quality of life gaps. Now, what did we think about a democracy? They should be humane and caring. They should also have long-term economic growth, and the majority should have the benefit. It's under this circumstance that our ancestors lived most of the time. And we can explain the that, that fact that over 1.8 million years, we've developed our humanity. We feel ethical. We want to give to the greater good. This is the reciprocity we all feel, the fairness we all feel. This has been honed over 1.8 million years. But occasionally, our ancestors were in the face of extreme power. And when they were in the face of extreme power, they had a do-or-die mentality. So, is this true? Have we inherited the psychological mechanisms of both in this case, too? Well, there was a very famous experiment by Stanley Milgram after World War II, and they wanted to know why the normal people that became guards in the Nazi state, how they could possibly murder men, women, and children in the gas chambers. So Stanley Milgram had an experiment. It's a very famous one at Yale University, and he brought regular people off the street, and he put them under cues of extreme hierarchy, hierarchy within the, the elite lab at Yale. And what he did was he assigned some of them to be teachers. And then what he said was that there was a student in the other room. And that for every time you made a mistake, the student made a mistake, that they should get an electrical shock. And the teacher was supposed to increase the intensity with each error. The results were absolutely astounding. The majority of people gave what would be a lethal shock when commanded to do so. Even, even Milgram himself said is not so much the kind of person a man is as the kind of situation in which he finds himself. A student of his, Philip Zimbardo, took this a step further. At Stanford University, he, what he did was he brought students into an environment that was like a prison. And he assigned some of them to be prison guards with extreme power and others to be prisoners with no power. They had to stop the experiment because the prison guards became so inhumane and brutal to the prisoners. But how did they feel? How did they feel when they, how did these prison guards feel when they were in this environment? First, when they were in a hierarchical environment where they had this power, and then later, when they were moved into a democratic society once again. I'm going to let one of them tell you because I can't do a better job than he does. Surprised you? No, I was dismayed to find out that I could, uh, I could really be a, uh, <laughs> that I could uh, act in a uh, manner so, so absolutely unaccustomed to anything I would even really dream of doing. And I, <laughs> and while I was doing it, I. Uh, I didn't feel any regret. I didn't feel any uh, uh, guilt. It was only after, afterwards, when I began to reflect on what I had done that this began to, this behavior began to dawn on me, and I realized that this was, uh, uh, this was a part of me I hadn't really noticed before. While he was embedded in hierarchy, he felt no remorse. He felt no regret. However. Once he was moved back into a democratic environment where this behavior is simply not allowed, then his humanity became expressed again. I can't, I can't tell you enough how important it is that each of us, in order to have our humanity continue to be honed into the future and, and expressed and grow, that we all need to be embedded, embedded in democratic environments, not hierarchical ones. At this point, I'm going to turn back over to Paul, and he's going to talk about democracy and the economic effects on our behavior. Thank you, Joanne. So let me begin that discussion with some mundane but ultimately astonishing economic data. So these are data from uh, England before 1710, although we have comparable data from many other places in the world. Uh, what's plotted here is individual wealth per capita GDP increasing left to right and population increasing bottom to top. Notice the obvious trend line. What does this tell you? It says that when population transiently collapses as a result of a plague epidemic, for example, individuals become briefly wealthier. 
But as population recovers, people become poor again as the limited productive capacity of pre-modern economic systems is exhausted or saturated. Let's compare that now to the very different world you and I take for granted. In order to do that, we have to zoom back because the scale is going to change. After 1710, the trend line is completely different. Both population and per capita GDP explode out of the Malthusian box. And in fact, we've continued on this trend line through the present moment. We're about 50 times richer than a typical citizen of Henry VIII's England, for example. The crucial point for us here is that this so-called modern economic miracle correlates precisely in space and time with the democratization of the modern state. Moreover, precisely as predicted by social coercion theory, the democratization of the modern state follows from the invention of gunpowder projectile weapons allowing large majority coalitions to seize back the state from the small armored elite military groups that policed the protection rackets that pre-modern states were. Moreover, this democracy effect is not restricted just to subsistence assets. It re is reflected in everything about us. So notice, for example, that the scientific revolution represented by Newton, the rise of modern music represented by Bach, or the birth of modern literature represented by the first commercially successful novels all also correlate precisely in space and time with the democratization of the state. The democratization of the state represents the ancient democratic human uh, adaptation writ large in the enormous scale of the state creating phenomenal productive and creative potential. Thus the struggle for democratization is an, not a recent eccentricity or conceit, it is an ancient biological imperative crucial to the human future. That struggle is ongoing, and though occasionally painful and slow, we are winning that struggle. So, for example, improved global communication is allowing all seven billion of us to more effectively project our conjoint threat, our political power, driving the democratization of our institutions, and we're better able to understand formally vexing problems like the dysfunction of our financial markets as simple failures to manage the conflict of interest problem. So, in conclusion, we are extremely optimistic that our greatly enhanced understanding of the, our, how our ancient biology maps onto our contemporary institutions puts us in a position to build a democratized future that's vastly wealthier, wiser, and more humane than the present or the past. Thank you. Thank you.